So um, welcome everybody um, to the session on climate change policy. My name is uh, Sonia Peterson. I am a senior researcher at the Kiel Institute for the World Economy and honorary professor at um, Kiel University. And then we also have uh, with us a host um, from the Center for Global Trade Analysis, which is um, Alfredo Cisneros Pineda. Um, hi, um, who is uh, yeah, uh, recording this session and helping everybody um, with, uh, with timekeeping. Um, so before we get actually started with our presentations, um, I'm asked to briefly remind you um, of the protocol for the following session, even though probably some of you have attended um, sessions before. So I see that actually already everybody is muted. That's great because we only want the presenter to be um, unmuted. Um, we will have um, three presentations and each presentation um, will uh, have 20 minutes time. And Alfredo will um, remind you two minutes before the end of this 20 minutes that the time is soon over. And um, at the end um, already there, um, you will be reminded that the 20 minutes are over and then I'm asked to kind of immediately uh, move to the, the following um, discussion of the paper following each paper. And for this, we will have um, 10 minutes. You can either raise your hand um, virtually and then I will call you in the order um, of the hands or you can also write in the chat. Um, and I will read um, to you, uh, to the presenters, um, the question so that you don't have to check the chat. I think we are a pretty small group here. I would prefer if a lot of people actually just raise their hands virtually and then talk themselves. But of course, you can do it um, as you like. Um, and between the sessions, we will have a two minute um, trans, um, uh, time for to transfer to the, to the next speaker. Um, well, I think that's um, all about the protocol. And now I'm very happy um, to introduce um, our first speaker, which is um, Karen uh, Tierfelder from the United States Naval Academy. And she will present her paper on the role of trade policy in climate mitigation, carbon border adjustment mechanisms. So that seems to be a topic not only um, in the EU where I'm based, but also in the US. And I'm looking very much forward um, to the presentation. So the, the floor is yours, Karen. Well, thank you very much. And let me get started. I'll share my screen. Let's put that up there. And let's make it bigger. Let's see. There. OK. So hopefully that all looks good. Um, if not, let me know, please. And thank you for the opportunity to present work today. Uh, this is a project I'm doing with Shanta Devarajan, Delphin Go, and Sherman Robinson. And we're looking at trade policy and climate change. And we are kind of exploring the links between the two. And so the policy question we're looking at, looking at rather, is how effective is trade policy in inducing countries to decarbonize? And so as, as commented, the you know, recent application we've looked at or common in policy discussion is a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, that's an EU policy designed to level the playing field. So if countries in Europe are taking measures to reduce CO2 emissions, then the countries that don't take those measures have an unfair uh, advantage in trade markets. And so in this context, trade policy is a general policy to correct for an unfair distortion. The idea of trade policy and climate change is not new. Uh, Nordhaus, uh, in a paper in the AER in 2015, proposed the idea of climate clubs. And so you are a member of the club. And so all club members take policies to reduce CO2 emissions and non-club members are punished and trade policy is the instrument to um, induce non-club members to try to participate in the club and so we called it the club's club you're clubbing the non-participants to try to induce them to behave better um, and so in both cases they recommend trade policy to help achieve climate policy objectives and we're looking at um, you know trying to explore um, the implications of, of using trade policy a bit of background, uh, this is data 
from the GTAP version 10, which is what we're using for the model. Um, as you can see, the two, looking at global CO2 emissions, um, the two dirtiest are China at 27% of global emissions and the US at 17% of global emissions. Um, the Europe, European Union, EU27 is at 9%. So um, you know, we have very different starting points. Um, and then on the second slide, looking at trade, we're saying, well, there's a limited reach of trade. And before I go further, Sonia, are my pictures in the way? Can you see the slide perfectly or do you see all? Should... We can see everything perfectly, at least I can. So I think everything is fine. Oh, thank you. I, I, thanks. Okay. Um, and so the, we're looking at trade policy to induce changes in CO2 emissions. So the second slide is looking at global trade. And one thing that we notice is there's a limited reach for global trade. Um, the US accounts for 10% of global trade. Uh, the, e, the, I'm sorry, China accounts for uh, about 13%. Those are the, the dirtiest countries. The EU, a relatively clean country in terms of global CO2 emissions, accounts for 30% of trade. Another thing that's different about the countries, and again, this is coming from GTAP 10 data, looking at the carbon emissions, is uh, we're, we're different starting points. So we're, here the industries we're looking at are the five uh, CBAM sectors. Uh, so the dirtiest sectors, fertilizer, iron and steel, uh, aluminum, cement, and electricity. And different countries, and this is data on CO2 emitted uh, to produce a unit of this uh, of these products. And so um, if you look at the green bars, the EU27 and other Europe, their carbon um, emissions rate per unit of output is pretty low. The US is a bit higher. Um, China is higher still. Uh, looking at in particular at electricity, some countries such as SACU, um, they're, they're, you know, they're dirty compared to most countries because they have the coal-fired um, electricity plants. So the point of this slide is just to say, gee, we're at different starting points, different countries have different CO2 intensities uh, in production. When we look at it, we drill down a bit, and here I'm just looking at the US, uh, EU27 and China, um, and we look at the energy inputs from GTAP, so coal, oil, gas, petroleum, and gas distribution. Um, the pollution per unit of intermediate used in production of fertilizer um, is pretty high in China. And so the numbers again in China um, are much higher than the numbers for the EU um, and the US is kind of in the middle. That helps us understand why China accounts for 27% of um, global CO2 emissions um, because they have pretty dirty production processes to start with. Another thing that's important is bilateral trade, uh, because we're gonna be looking at you know, trade policy to induce changes in climate, and we're gonna focus on the dirty polluter, the dirty um, you know, big CO2 emitters, the US and China. So this um, graph, or this table rather, shows bilateral trade with each country. So um, if I look at Canada and Mexico, uh, perhaps it's not a surprise. Um, they're pretty dependent on the U.S. for exports uh, and for imports. So we have pretty, you know, with NAFTA and USMCA, we have pretty well-established trade connections um, with among the three countries. Similarly, when we look at trade with China, countries in East and Southeast Asia are pretty dependent on China for trade, and that's what the blue boxes are showing. Um, and we're going to, you know, those trade dependencies will matter when we're looking at um, trade policy uh, to achieve climate um, goals. So that's a bit of background. How are we going to analyze it? We're going to use a, the GLOBE model, which is a multi-region, multi-sector general equilibrium model. We are going to look at production with a nested production function, and I have a slide with more detail in a, in a moment. Um, 
But the point of doing that is we're making energy inputs substitutable with capital. So producers can respond to changes in energy input prices by substituting to less expensive inputs. So we're putting the tax into the first order conditions. So when producers are making input choices, when they face a tax on carbon, um, they're gonna substitute away from those inputs. We're gonna look at a carbon tax based on the CO2 emitted per unit of energy commodity used. We're just gonna look at the direct CO2 emitted um, other studies have looked at direct and indirect effects with input output analysis. Uh, if you use, if you're a producer and you use a lot of electricity, well, you're also contributing to CO2 because electricity is a pretty dirty, can be pretty, you know, uh, polluting. That's interesting. And we've, in the paper, we've looked at how much higher um, the CO2 emission is when we account for direct and indirect effects, but it's a comp, it, it requires, you know, it's not what the policymakers seem to be proposing, and it's more complicated than just looking at the direct effects. So we, we decided for this presentation, we'll just comment on the results with the direct effects. As I um, alluded to earlier, we're using GTAP version 10 with 19 regions. Uh, we have 22 sectors, and each of the five dirty sectors that um, uh, the CBAM addresses our ind independent sectors, and then we have the energy sectors from GTAP, and we use GTAP emissions data. This describes the production structure. So at the top level of the nest, we have output QX. It's an aggregate of intermediates and value added. There's limited, but you, you, we could have some substitution between those two. And so that's what the sigma indicates, possibility of substitution, but it's pretty low. I'm gonna focus on the value added side because I think that's where the interesting uh, description of how energy uh, policies are gonna hit the economy. It's on the value added side. So we have value added is an aggregate of labor, land, natural resources, and capital and energy. And so capital and energy uses capital and an aggregate of energy, and there's some substitution there. Um, the aggregate energy is a further nested structure. So there's electricity, and then there are fossil fuels. And then the five fossil fuels are the nest at the very bottom here. So there's a lot of substitution. Um, you know, many ways you could just, uh, construct the nest, but the point is the producers are going to respond to tax policies that affect the cost of inputs here. How do we model it? Well, we have a tax on carbon. We use $75 uh, coming from an IMF study suggesting that you know, that's a reasonable rate for developed countries. Um, it depends on the carbon intensity in production. So that's what this blue bar is indicating. So we'll look at CO2 emitted. Um, per unit of output when I um, use an energy input such as coal into producing an activity um, relative to how much of that intermediate I use. So it takes into account different intensities. And as we saw in the previous, few previous earlier slides, the carbon intensity per unit of intermediate is very different across countries. It's much higher in China, for example, than it was for the, is in the EU 27. And then we collect tax revenue. So we have this carbon tax against how many intermediates are used. We also think about a carbon tariff. And so we'll use the trade partners CO2 emission um, to produce in production to calculate the carbon tariff. We, again, to be consistent, we'll use a $75 tax per carbon. And then we'll base it on how much the trade partner uh, when they're producing good, you know, particular good, how much total emission they get from burning the five fossil fuels. We have the distinction between commodities and activities. So the activity is where we make the product. That's the production function. The commodity is how it's marketed. That's where the tax is hitting. So that's what this map is doing. It's just translating from commodity to activity. We use GTAP data. So it's a one-to-one -one mapping but the code is flexible. If I, if I use GTAP power data, for example, 
I could have different production activities producing electricity. And so I could capture the differences in technology. So that's what this piece is getting at. But the point is the carbon tariff is based on how dirty production is in your trade partner. And we model it as a specific tariff and it's affecting the price of, of the imported good. We have whatever the tariff is, and then we have a specific tariff coming in um, based on the carbon content of production. So with that, we look at two scenarios or two strands of scenarios. So we're gonna look at CBAM and we'll be optimistic and assume the US participates. Um, and so we'll assume the high income countries decide to have first a carbon tax. So they're going to tackle pollution domestically. And then they're going to use tariffs to level the playing field. So their trade partners who, um, you know, the non-high income countries are going to have a, a tax on their carb, the CBAM tariffs um, coming in. And again, it's the five dirty commodities uh, identified um, in the, by, you know, for CBAM. That's one scenario. And then we'll look at climate clubs. And a club, again, is we're using trade policy, not so much to change trade patterns or level the playing field, but rather to induce the non-club members to change their domestic behavior. So we want to damage their economy enough so they think uh, it's worth it to participate in the club. So again, we'll use a $75 tax on carbon and for the club members, and then we're gonna raise tariffs on imports from non-club members on all um, imports. It's a punitive tariff. It's not based on the carbon content of production. And we picked a 30 percentage point increase on existing tariffs. Um, we look at a couple of interesting, we think scenarios. So we say, well, what if China does not participate in the club? So they're the single holdout. And then what if the US is a single holdout? Again, they don't participate in the club. Uh, and then we say, well, what if they're holdouts together? And we focus on the US and China because they are the two dirtiest, um, you know, they, they contribute the most to CO2 and um, they are, you know, they've been reluctant to adopt some of the policies that the EU has already undertaken. So it's reasonable to think they might be a holdout. So first, what do we look, we'll see, well, what do the policies do, starting with CBAM to global emissions? Um, not much, we find. Uh, if you can see, so when everybody has a carbon tax, um, that's kind of our reference point of $75 um, per ton of carbon, global emissions go down about 25%. When I just put that carbon tax on the high income regions, it's not much of an impact. 7.2% per uh, cent decline in global CO2 emissions. Um, and part of that, a large part of that is we don't have China. Uh, that's, a, uh, you know, this is just the tax, um, the, the high income countries that have a carbon tax. And then they also, when they also have CBAM, um, doesn't do much at all, doesn't do anything different, at least for global emissions. So CBAM we find is not very effective as an instrument to reduce global carbon emissions. And that perhaps is not the policy objective, um, but that's, a, that's what we find uh, in the data here or in the scenario here. And I say, okay, well, what does it do? You know, what we expect it to do. Um, we see a decline, how, do, how are imports, impacted when we have CBAM tariffs. So are they effective as at leveling the, the playing field? And we see some evidence of that. So again, the blue bar is just when we have the high income countries put a, a tax on carbon. Uh, there's a decline in demand for um, dirty inputs. And so we see a decline in both you know, in imports and domestic demand. So that's what the blue bars are picking up. The orange bars are saying, okay, in addition to that, let's tax the dirty inputs, uh, the, the five commodities, fertilizer, iron and steel, aluminum, cement, and electricity, put a tariff on them based on their carbon content in production. And I guess it works as you might expect, uh, the imports go down. So the orange bars show a bigger decline in imports um, when we have the CBAM tariffs in place. Likewise, we could say, okay, how does it help producers? Does it level the playing field? Does their production benefit? And again, we find yes, with the tariffs on the dirty inputs, 
imports rather, the, the orange bars, we have the tariffs, the CBAM tariffs output in, uh, for example, the EU27 declines less in these sectors. So again, less import competition because you know, we've leveled the playing field. So um, that's gonna help the domestic producers. These results are consistent across the high income regions. I just picked the EU27 as a representative case, but the full, de the full details are available in the paper. All right, so that's one use of trade policy and it, it's effective at um, leveling the playing field, but it's not very effective at reducing global carbon emissions. When we look at the CBAM approach. Next, we look at clubs. And by the clubs, we're looking at punitive tariffs against the holdout region or regions. Uh, first best scenario is everybody's in the club. Uh, again, the 25, almost 25% reduction in global CO2 emissions if all regions have a $75 tax on carbon. Um, and then we look at different holdouts. So suppose China doesn't join the club. Well, then global emissions go down 12.9%. Again, China's pretty important as part of the strategy to, to, you know, to, to reduce global carbon emissions. Uh, when the US is not part of the club, but China is, um, US is the only holdout, global emissions go down 20%. Um, and then you know, they go down a little bit more when, when everybody, when, when, excuse me, when, when the US um, and China are both um, part of the, our both holdouts. Um, we get, I'm sorry, we get less of a reduction in global emissions because we're leaving out the two big players. Karen, what, you have two minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, and again, we can see that when there are punitive tariffs, um, emissions go down further. The interesting or the point of clubs is they're supposed to damage the holdout region. And so we find that's the case. When China is the holdout region, uh, its real absorption goes down 4.5%. When the U.S. is the holdout region, its real absorption goes down. Um, both of them have an exchange rate depreciation because we are, nobody wants their products. So they're, they're facing a lot of difficulty getting exports into other markets. So a depreciation offsets that um, because we're holding the current account balance constant. And another interesting damage to the clubs is the tariff revenue that is collected against their products. So other countries are getting the tariff revenue. Second interesting point is their damage to the club members. So if the US is the holdout, um, we get a depreciation of the US currency and exports from Canada and Mexico decline. Um, their total exports decline because the US is so important to them as we saw in the trade data. And we see a similar pattern when we look at countries dependent on China, countries in East and Southeast Asia. So club members are hurt in the process. And to quickly wrap up, um, with CBAM, uh, we find that the best strategy is for everybody to tax carbon emissions. China is a crucial participant and CBAM tariffs they correct unfair advantages, but they don't contribute to a global reduction in CO2 emissions. Clubs, they're a pretty powerful mechanism to induce cooperation because they impose serious cost to the holdout regions in terms of absorption, um, adjustments to the structure of production and trade, lost revenue that their trade partners collect against their um, exports. And even the club members, um, suffer and could suffer. And in the case of the trade dependent ones, um, they see a major reduction. Um, sorry, I jumped back there. The, the club members are damaged um, if they have deep trade relations. So Mexico and Canada to the US, East and Southeast Asia with China. Um, so we find that punitive tariffs, you know, the clubs might not work because punitive tariffs may not be supported by club members if they're trade dependent on the holdout region. So that was a kind of an interesting insight, we think, in terms of the discussion of climate clubs. With that, I will stop and I'm happy to take questions. Um, thank you. 
Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much for this very interesting um, presentation. We will have now 10 minutes for um, discussion, and I may remind you that you can either raise your hand, which I already see in some cases, and um, already also use the chat. And maybe I will be uh, do a mixture of both and start with a very early um, question in the chat and then move on um, to others. So the, the first question that was posed um, is, um, is it common to consider a CES between capital and energy and value added? Is it empirically correct? But is it logical? What is wrong to specify energy as an intermediate um, commodity? I think there has already been some answer, but maybe you want to um, extend it. Ah, thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, it, energy as part of uh, the input output uh, as a straight intermediate, um, it's used in fixed proportions to output. If it's part of value added um, as a fact, you know, then it's substitutable and producers can, when I put a tax or when a tax is imposed, um, producers can substitute away from the more expensive input to the extent that the CE, you know, technology lets them what the CES function allows. So that's why we decided to move the, um, or allow the energy inputs to be part of value added. And one way to think about that is um, if energy, if, if coal gets more expensive, maybe producers would use different types of capital inputs. Maybe they use wind uh, to generate electricity instead of coal. Um, a crude way to capture that is to have a CES between capital and energy. A more sophisticated way would be to have different production technologies that could produce electricity and have substitution among those. Um, but in this context, uh, one way to, to hint at that idea would be to have energy substitutable with capital. So, and I think it's been done in other studies as well, um, thinking about McKibben, has done some work on this and Rutherford and Boringer have done some work. And I think they have maybe not the same nesting structure, but they move energy inputs into the value added nest. Okay, thank you, Karen. Um, I have now a, quest a raised hand from Matthias. So maybe you just turn on your mic and ask the question. Your question. Thanks, that's probably easiest. I have a quick technical question and then a follow-up more uh, or broader question. The technical question is on, I saw that the impact on say fertilizer was relatively low or compared to other sectors. When we have looked at the EU, um, well, proposal for, for fertilizers we found, or for the general CBAM effect, we found that fertilizers is quite affected compared to the other sectors. And I wonder whether that is really a fertilizer sector, which is much more emission intensive than the chemical sector overall, or whether that's just the GTAP um, aggregate. And then the second question is, um, when, when I was hearing your results on like, who's better off under what conditions, I think there is quite some literature looking at it from a game theoretic perspective or coalition stability analysis. Um, have you looked at like, what are the incentives for China or the US to either join or uh, be out of the carbon club? And then also whether whatever that decision has happened, whether the final club is still stable or whether they are, um, whether it's then optimal for say Mexico or Canada to also drop out to make this uh, final stable, stable coalition even smaller. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you again, both very good questions. You are correct. Our fertilizer is just chemicals and fertilizer that the GTEP sector, I didn't take it a step further to disaggregate. So that, that, that perhaps explains why we don't get as dramatic of results as you were expecting. Um, and then you're right, there's a long, there's a, an interesting strand of literature with game theory, looking at coalition st stability, um, Nordhaus with the climate clubs. Um, I think Rutherford and others have done a paper looking at the strategic benefit of carbon tariffs. And so again, it's, it's the idea of a coalition. That's the next step we'd like to do with this is to think about more, now that we saw the interesting result that the trade dependent countries may not be so happy as part of the coalition, it might not be stable. Um, we'd like to explore that a bit further. So I, that, that's kind of an area for further research. Um, because I think that, that was a kind of interesting result that we found. So. 
Okay, thank you. We have another question now in the chat from uh, Mary. Uh, and the question is, have you had an opportunity to view the effects on consumers? Inflation is a politically sensitive issue. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, that's a good question also. Um, we play in a different context working with Sherman Robinson at, and people at the Peterson Institute. We've looked at how when you take off tariffs, what it does to uh, the CPI. Um, we haven't done it in the context of this paper, but uh, the, in the context in that study, uh, when we took off the tariffs, um, we found that there was a, you know, a link between uh, taking off tariffs and the impact it would have on the, the uh, consumer price index. Uh, not done yet for this paper, but yeah, that would be an interesting component to look at. Um, the other thing we haven't, we've thought about in terms of consumers in this paper, but we have yet to address is our carbon tax is just on producers. So the, you know, use energy inputs and you have a tax. The data also looks at households and households consume um, petroleum and we have the CO2 emissions there. So we could add the carbon tax to households and, and see what impact that has on households um, because that would be another channel for, for price impacts to be felt. So um, I'll make a note that that's an interesting extension, thanks. Okay, we have another raised hand. Larry, would you just turn on your mic and ask your question? Hello, everyone. Thanks, uh, Karen, for this uh, interesting and great uh, presentation. Um, I'm glad to see that um, uh, when uh, my paper joined, joined with um, our, our Mc Warren McKeeban that you, you just mentioned, mm -hmm. and shared, this, shared a similar finding that um, um, this carbon border adjustment indeed didn't contribute to uh, reducing global emissions. Mm -hmm. And um, are you also you also uh, show show that um, this uh, see, this border uh, carbon border adjustment help to level the the playing field. And um, so my question is now: This is the European Union is uh, proposing this um, uh, this mechanism. So my question is that um, given this um, carbon border adjustment, it doesn't contribute to reducing global emissions. And um, although it helps to level the playing uh, playing field, but it also has high Administrative uh, cost of of implementing this um, um, this uh, mechanism. So, what is your view about um, about this um, uh, implementing the policy? Are you favor Are you in favor of this policy or against this policy? Thank you. Hmm, that's a very good question. Um, I don't think trade. I think. It's a tough one because I think the administrative costs, though I haven't investigated that in detail, I suspect the, invest, the administrative costs are pretty high and you're hitting such a small part of the problem. You're not hitting production, you're hitting just trade. And so it might, as an economist might say, well, the benefit might not be worth the cost of administering it, although I'm not a politician. And so the politicians might um, advocate it because domestic producers in the EU are upset with the unfair import competition. Um, but I agree, I don't think, I think the administrative costs outweigh the benefits. And so I, I think it's a tough, tough one to administer and um, because you're not hitting the bulk of the problem, you're just hitting trade, which is a small com you know, component of these countries' um, production. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sense. I think we have one or two minutes and there's no more question. I might have the time to, to ask a question or actually more a comment. So um, there is, uh, actually I've seen quite a bit of simulations of border carbon adjustment, but I think all the models I've seen have a fixed exchange rate. So that might be really interesting. I mean, you, you talked a bit on this to really um, focus on this a bit and discuss what changes if you have a flexible exchange rate in your model. Because I guess since trade is so important here, it, it, it should really matter. Ah, yes, that, that's a, a good point. Um, and I kind of glossed over some of the closure rules that we have in the model. We use the model in comparative static mode. So I don't, you know, it's not a recursive dynamic model. Um, and so typically we assume the current account balance is constant because that's borrowing coming in. And we don't, you know, if, if we had 
if we could borrow more, then suddenly our welfare would go up and I don't take into account when I have to pay it back because it's a one-time shock and a comparative static model. So it's like a gift coming into the economy. So for that reason, we hold the current account balance constant and therefore the exchange rate has to adjust. If we had the, and so that's where we get these interesting exchange rate stories um, that, that drive the impact on trade partners. Uh, so the U.S., depreciates and Mexico and Canada then have a hard time getting products into US markets and that really hurts them because they're so dependent on the US. Um, we could try it and maybe it'd be a good comment to say, well, the flip side of that is if I had a fixed exchange rate, I'd see more bigger changes in um, the trade flows. You know, the, the current account balance um, would be changing and I could pick up the, the change, the impacts on trade that way, so. Okay, thank you. I think we are exactly in the time schedule now, and I don't see any further questions here. And, um, uh, can I can I jump in to follow follow on this uh, discussion? Um, I think we have a transition time of two minutes. If you use one minute, I will uh, manage to keep the transition time to uh, yeah, one sure, minute. And maybe the next presenter can already start sharing um, the screen. Yeah, I have a very quick quick um, now follow follow up. Um, um, and so in your model, Karen just said in your model, you assume this uh, current count is constant. Um, I'm currently working with uh, with uh, Interna International Monetary Fund. We we are in investigating the impact of this carbon taxes or broadly climate policies on, on international capital flow. We find that um, um, our capital uh, carbon taxes have, have very strong if impact on, on, on international capital flows. That is a, on the current count balance. So, um, if carbon taxes is, is, are, are high in model, not sure if it is reasonable to assume the uh, constant current count. Okay, very yeah, that's interesting. Um, are you presenting that work today, or, or this at the conference, or do you have a reference to it? I mean, I'd be really curious to have a look. No, no, I'm, I'm not going to present that today. Uh, that will be the my work. That that work will appear at um, this IMF this year's um, external sector report. Okay. which will be published in, 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 uh, in August. Okay, I will look for that, thank you. Um, and I will try it, I will try it without, you know, um, the flexible exchange rates and see what, what's going on there and the capital yeah. flow changes. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Okay, we will then move on to our next presenter and there has been some confusion on my side about the name in the, in the um, session description and the actual presenter. If I was right in my chat, the name of the next presenter is actually um, Chi, um, uh, Chien Wei Hu He, and he will um, present a paper also on um, border carbon adjustment, but from a Chinese um, perspective, which is probably because he is from uh, the Development Research Center of the State Council of the People's Republic from China. I hope that this is right in my session description. And um, you will have now the floor to present the paper, The Impact of EU's Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism on China's Economy. And we already Already see your slides, but not yet in the presenters mode. Um, so maybe you switch to the pre. Great, that looks great. So uh, might take it some time. Still not in the presenter. Maybe you click again or so. It's not yet in the presenter. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hi. Can we you can hear me? you. Yes, we can, but okay, your good. slides are not yet in the presenter's mode. Can you see my slides? Slides? Yeah, we can see them, but no, now they disappeared. So you have to show them again. They were there, Sorry. but now they are gone. <laughs> let, let's do it again. Yeah, and... Give me a moment. Sorry. Yes, we can see them again. It's it's not in presenters mode, but I think it's also fine like this if, if, if there is a, a problem with this. So maybe you just go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman, that. So uh, the, my topic is very clo is close to the to first presenter, yeah, the, but the target is different. Uh, for my, uh, uh, for our study that we try to study the impact of EU carbon, for the adjustment mechanism on China's economy. Uh, the three parts in my presentation. Firstly, we'd like to show some background information. I think that the first 
presentator had to show some background uh, information. We uh, focus on the motivation of our study. Secondly, we'd like to show them uh, so the model and the scenarios in our study. Finally, we we'll just show the result and the conclusion. So let's go next. Uh, I think most of you have know that the 2021 that EU Commission adapted a proposal for Sorry to interrupt you. Did you start your presentation? Sorry. We still see your start slide. I don't know if you, you cannot see my slides. We just see the start slide, the first one. I'm not sure if you clicked to the next one. Yes. Oh, we cannot see it. We just see the first slide. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. yes, we see. Now we see the. Oh, now it's gone again. There was the second slide, but now the end you have to share again. Okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry for interrupting, but I thought it's better. Um, if we see your slides. <laughs> How about now? Yeah, now we see the second slide. Oh, now it's the first again, but there was the second slide. So if you go forward to the second How slide. How about the second slide? We still see the first one. I think now? it's better if you go out of the presentation mode and then just click on the next ones. Yes, I, I collect. How about now? I think you should go out of the presentation. That that that's that works. Sorry. I think the problem is that you're when you do presentation modes, it's like showing the different. How about now? Uh, yeah. That's perfect. Okay, let's go ahead. Sorry, uh, um, I think most of you know that uh, 2021, the EU Commission adapted a, a proposal for the carbon boat adjustment mechanism. They want to, to they want to put a carbon car price on the impulse of a targeted select, selection of products. So why we do I would do this study? I think maybe there are three reasons. Why is that you know that it, you is China the second biggest importer. That and now let's see this slice. This figure shows uh, the China's trade partner. Uh, you can see that if just follow the United States, the European Union. Uh, in 2020, that the uh, European Union has export to China. It's uh, the export uh, of China to, uh, from China to you is about. Uh, 464 billion of US dollar account for 15.4 of percent of China's total export. So that means that the EU is a very important trade partner with China. Yeah. That's the first reason why I do this study. The second reason is that you know that uh, the China now China's carbon price is uh, very low. That after more than 10 years. Regional trail, China's nationwide carbon trade market was finally launched in, on, in Shanghai on July 16, 2021. But by now, that the carbon price in China, uh, in China carbon market is just close to $10 uh, per ton of CO2. So, to, so that means that the carbon price in China is much lower than that in EU East, yeah, uh, in, EU, in, EU, in European Union. So that, is, uh, that means that if the uh, carbon board adjustment mechanism is implement, uh, implement that the impact will be, will be very big. The third, the third reason why we do the study is that, that you know that the, the carbon intensity of China's products is much higher than that of you. The cost of uh, the carbon intensity of China's products is, is, is significantly higher that than you and other, many other countries. In 2019, the China's carbon emission per unit of GDP was 0.1. Uh, six uh, one nine four five. K 
kilogram carbon per uh, dollars, US dollars, which is about uh, 3.8 times of European Union. So why is that the, the China's carbon intensity is very high? I think maybe the, the, the most reason is about the energy construction that. Uh, in, in China, the, the, the coal play a very important role that the property of a coal-fired power in China is close to uh, 17, uh, 70%, which is much higher than that in European Union and the world average. So we can see that the, the lower carbon price, the high carbon emission intensity, and the, the EU as the second largest export market for China. So all of these three factors determine that the potential impact of EU carbon board adjustment mechanism on China cannot be underestimated. So that means that's the reason why we do this study that. So let's talk about the scenario and the model in our study. So firstly, that will describe the describe the scenario that. Uh, according to the European Union's document that uh, the CBM will be phased in gradually and will initially apply only to a selected number of goods at high risk of carbon leakage. Uh, that means that just uh, cover the iron stick, cement, fertilizer, aluminum, uh, and electricity generation. Once the definitive system become fully operation, operational in, 20, uh, in 2026, European Union imports will have to declare annually the quantity of goods and the amount of embodied emission in total goods they were imported into European Union in preceding year. That means in the second stage that the, the CBM will cover all goods. So that in our study, we designed two scenarios. One we call the simplified CBM scenario. The, not one, the, 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 the other one is the, so it's, uh, it's, called, so it's called as uh, the fourth CBM scenario. That there's a two different for the scenario. One is that the, the product scope. Another one is about the how to measure the emission. So in the simplified CBM scenario, that we just just five goods were covered by in the CBM. That means uh, the, including the iron and steel, cement, fertilizer, aluminum, minimum, and the electricity generation. As for the first scenario, that all goods will be covered. So the second difference is that is how to measure the carbon emission. In the simplified CBM scenario, the, that means that the, the carbon tag just imposed on the, just imposed based on the direct emission. What means the direct emission? Demand means that the emission from the production process of goods over which the producer has, has, direct, has direct control. The indirect emission means that the emission from the product, production of a material which is consumed during the production process of goods imported by you. So let's talk about the, the model we used in our study. We used the Invigid model, which is, uh, uh, is, is uh, developed by Dominic at uh, World Bank. This model is a uh, recursive dynamic and uh, global uh, CG model, model. But in our study, we just do it a uh, uh, comparative statistic analy uh, analysis. Uh, in this study, the production is implemented as a series of nested CS function to capture the subsidy, the subsidy across all inputs. The model incorporates five types of production facts, uh, including the labor, capital, land, and the 
sector special needs resource. Income comes from the payments to uh, to factors of production and it's allocated to household. The government sector club collect all net tax payment and purchase goods and service. Trade is model used the I mean, specification to reflect the different origin of demand for goods. So the database we used that to tab 11. Uh, in, in our study, we, the, uh, the all uh, countries and the region in GTAB will be aggregated to 16 regions, just as a list in the slides. Uh, we have 27 sectors in the model. I think that uh, as the presentation for the first presenter, that, that in, in, in this study, the, the carbon tax then, well, depends on the three issues. One is that the carbon intensity, but this is different in, for different scenarios. In the simplified scenario, the carbon intensity just include the uh, direct emission, carbon emission. For the full scenario, we are include the direct and indirect. That. The, the second issue is about the, the, the gap of carbon price between the EU and the original country. The third issue is that the share of goods covered by CBM in this in the in the given sector. We calculated the, the, the tax rate, the tariff, the carbon tariff in the different scenario. This is the, the carbon tariff in the simplified scenario. The second one is a, a slide a slide the picture shows the, the carbon tariff in the full scenario. Now let's turn to the result and the conclusion. Uh, based, uh, according to the simulation, we found that in the simplified scenario, the impact is very limited. The data results show that the CBM will just result in a 0.02% drop in China's GDP. As, uh, as for export, it's just the 0.07% uh, decrease. So why the in simplified scenario the impact is so so very so so small so limited? Uh, I think so, so there are four reasons. Uh, the one the first one is that you know that the, these five products covered by uh, covered in the simplified scenario just account for one percent three five percent of China's total export. So that means that all these products are not the main. China's export goods. The second reason is why is the, the impact is so limited is that in this in the simplified scenario, only direct carbon emission are cons, cons, concert, in uh, so that that means that the carbon tariff is very limited, is very small. The third reason is that all these products are basically are uh, basically upstream products. That means that uh, all these covered products are interme intermediate inputs or are not finable uh, goods. So that means that the, the, they have a very limited relation with other sectors. The final reason is that as, as, they, as these five products that the country with a uh, strong trade ties with EU and not China's major trade partner. So let's turn to the another scenario. The, we find that the compare with the simplified scenario that the impact in the full scenario is much higher than that. The data show that in the in full scenario that China's GDP will be reduced by 0.64% compared with without CBM. We also, find, we also can see the, the, the big decrease for export. The data show that the export from China to EU as a whole will fall, will fall by around 17%. Uh, uh, the, the energy sector and the energy intensity sectors will suffer the big loss. 
but uh, for the for the good closed and the, the electronic sector that the, the impact is limited. Uh, another very interesting uh, result is about the, the trade transfer that the in the for CBM scenario that we can find that the the CBM will result in a double ch challenge for China's industry. On the one on the one hand that the the carbon emissions intensity the on the one hand that that means China's export of labor intensive sectors such as clothes to EU will be replaced by other developing countries. That means that in EU close market that China will be replaced by other developing countries. Why? Because that the carbon intensity of labor intensity sectors uh, goods in China is single significant higher than that of other developing countries. Let's take, uh, if we look at the closing sector that, that means that we can find the carbon intensity, carbon intensity in China is about 0.149 kilogram carb, carbon per US dollar, which is about two to five times of that of developing countries such as uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Africa. Another, on the other hand, we can find that China's technology intensity sector, such as the electronic sector, will face the risk of reaching, returning to the developed countries. Why? Because that the carbon intensity, the carbon emission intensity of technology intensity, intensive sectors such as the electronic in China is significantly it's, it's lower than some other developing countries, but it's significantly higher than that in developed countries. The carbon emission intensity of China's electron, electronic group products is about 0 0.13 kilogram carbon per US dollar, which is about two to seven times of that of Develop countries such as European countries, such as the United States. So the implement of a CBM will widen China's disadvantage relative to the developed country. So that's all. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. You're right in time, um, um, uh, even without uh, any reminder. Um, are there actually any questions? So you can either post them in the chat. I don't see um, anything there. Um, or you can just raise your hand. I think well, there's a lot of um, interesting results that you presented. Thank you very much. So I'm sure there should be some questions. Oh, I see some. Matthias, um, you go first. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, very interesting presentation. Also, uh, interesting to look at these trade diversion effects. So you say um, China is losing some trade to the EU because China is dirtier than others. So others supply more and fill the gap. Is that happening also the other way around? So is China increasing its export to countries which are not subject to the carbon tariff? So for example, are they importing, exporting more to the US or other Asian economies? Have you looked at that? Uh, yes, uh, I think that we will find the result. But the but how to say that the 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 change is very small. Okay, further questions? If not, I um, might actually have some myself, and then the others you can think about questions afterwards. So um, also again, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have actually just a few um, questions about how you model things. Maybe I missed something, um, but what is the carbon price you assumed uh, in Europe is one um, question. And then um, can you say something on the emission <coughs> impact? So how much does maybe carbon leakage 
reduces. And then the third question would be how is actually Europe impacted? It might have been on some slide, but I might have not um, seen it. So that would be three questions. Thank you. Okay. The first question is about the yield price, carbon price. Is it right? Yes. What did you assume about the carbon price in the EU? Uh, I think we used the date from the World Bank. I know that, uh, I know that, uh, that uh, uh, I remember that uh, the carbon price in EU ETS is now it's, uh, it's close to 80 US, 80 US dollars. The second question is, uh, you, you ask that is about the carbon leakage in the model that. So yes, yeah, I think that we can find that the CBM can reduce the the carbon leakage uh, in, in some uh, how to say that yes, but I I I, I don't remember the 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 the, 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 the date that I don't I cannot re record the, the the date that yes the the CBM will 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 reduce the the the, the carbon leakage. Sorry, I beg your pardon. What's the third question? Yeah, how much does Europe suffer or gain from this um, uh, CBAM? Um, did you, yeah, relative to a no CBAM scenario? It might have been on some one slide, but I might have just missed it. Oh, sorry, you, 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 no, no, you, no, you, 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 you. Uh, my in in the, in our study, find the the the, the how to say that for the micro level that that I means for the how to say that the impact on the GDP is very small. But the price, but the, the 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 price will be increased. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions, Larry? You go next. Thank you, uh, Sanja. I just wanted to follow our Sanja's second question. Um, so, does your paper uh, uh, contain contain any? The number of impacts of uh, this uh, Europe's uh, CBA on China's emission change, and also uh, global global emissions as well. Yes, yes, yes. But there sorry, are, right? the, 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 yes, we have the data, but uh, in the presentation we didn't we, we, we do not present it. Yes, because okay, we use the global model. Yes, yes. Okay, sorry, but uh, I, I cannot give the data now. That. Yeah, I will check your paper. Yes, thank you. Further questions either in the chat? I don't see any, any raised hands. If not, I might actually have another question. <laughs> and this is actually a more a suggestion. I mean, one idea of the EU is, but which I don't think it will work, but still it is that uh, this might be in the, the CBA might be an incentive to raise own carbon prices. So I think it would be interesting to add another scenario where China um, increases its carbon price to uh, has a policy that implies a carbon price comparable to those in the EU and see what actually happens then how they how they are doing it might just be an interesting scenario I, 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 I doubt that it will incentivize China to raise the price but still <laughs> Yes, thank you. It's, it's a very good question, good, good uh, suggestion. Uh, maybe we, we can try to do it and see the result. Here. Thank you so much. Yes, okay. We would have the time for another round of questions. So kind of last call for questions, I would say. Okay, I don't see any further questions. Thank you very much again um, uh, for this uh, very nice presentations. And I see that um, it's not only a hot policy debate, but also uh, initiating great research um, on the effects of the European CBAM. So I guess we will then um, 
move on um, to our third presenter, um, which is Jean Fouré from the OECD. And um, he will present a paper, um, Economic Resilience in the Low Carbon Transition, a CGE analysis of climate policies beyond carbon pricing. And I'm curious to see what the policies beyond carbon pricing will be. So Jean, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share uh, my screen. Um, can you see the presentation in presentation mode? Yes, I can, and I guess the yeah. others uh, can Perfect. also. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity and for the introduction. So I'm going to present an ongoing work we have at the OECD with Elisa Lanzi and Filippo Pavanello. Uh, Elisa is also in the room. Um, so uh, my presentation will be uh, a threefold one. So first an introduction, then I will talk a bit about the model and scenario setup. And third, uh, a focus on the main goal of the project, uh, which is the implication of the low carbon transition on public finance with an example for the EU. So first, as a bit of context, uh, so I will depart from the, 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 the CBAM and I will not consider it uh, uh, actually. Uh, we will make the assumption that uh, every incentive is there such that country will achieve uh, their net zero, net zero emission goals. Um, and the, this is because more and more countries are uh, committing to, to do so by 2050 or 2060. Uh, so currently we have in the world one, uh, 127 countries uh, who have pledged to some sort of net zero emission trajectory. And uh, all of them are different, but uh, they all have these net zero emissions. At the same time, uh, the, um, the, the different countries can have struggles in terms of public budget. So for instance, uh, due to the recovery stimulus after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, so the, the OECD has quantified the, the amount of the stimulus to uh, 300 billion uh, US dollars. And this might, this might pose a question on fiscal sustainability. So the, the question of this fiscal sustainability remains open in the net zero transition. And we will try to contribute to this debate by linking so gl ambitious global mitigation with a focus on uh, instruments uh, to, that might have an impact on, uh, on public uh, finance. Um, so why do we ask this question? This is because a lot of different policy levers can be used to achieve climate mitigation goals. We already talked quite a lot about carbon pricing, which is the one that was uh, uh, more trendy in the past uh, decades, let's say. Um, but there are also other pricing uh, mechanisms, such as uh, the removal of uh, subsidy to fossil fuel uh, production and consumption. Um, and these two examples, so uh, increasing carbon pricing or decreasing fossil fuel support, both generate government revenues. At the opposite side, we also have other different policy levers, uh, such as direct investment by uh, public authority or subsidies uh, for behavioral change and, uh, and uh, technology, uh, clean technology, let's say, that are an additional expenditure. Uh, for the for the government and the third uh, type of instruments are regulations uh, which let's say put a norm, a norm on let's say emission content or uh, spending uh, of on certain uh, commodities uh, and these uh, regulations uh, have unclear effect on government budget it can be either way depending on the, the overall effect these uh, regulations have on the economy. Of course, there are a lot of different factors that also affect public finance, uh, all the ma macroeconomic determinants, uh, demographics, productivity, and so on, but also all the indirect effects of decarbonization policies. Uh, for instance, if you switch from brown sector to green sectors, then uh, you, you might change uh, also the, the different uh, tax revenues and expenditures depending on the relative uh, rates of the sectors that are exchanged. Um, so we relate to quite a lot of literature on this uh, deep decarbonization pathways. So uh, a lot of 
the majority of them are conducted with uh, integrated assessment models, uh, which are uh, kind of like CGE, but not, uh, not exactly. Um, and um, most of them consider net zero uh, CO2 emissions being attained between 2017 and 2018. Uh, on the other hand, we have CGE models already working on net zero emissions. So we have a, a kind of examples here. Um, they can have a global or regional scope, but uh, uh, they mostly reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, and CO2 emissions by carbon pricing mechanisms. Um, on the subtopic of fossil fuel subsidies, there are also some evaluations to which we relate. Uh, one with uh, CGE, actually the same one I'm using here um in 2011 and another one uh with an iim um so what is the contribution of this paper compared to the existing literature so we will have a global scope we will introduce industrial process co2 emissions uh which are let's say the the emissions that are not directly linked to energy consumption but more to the industrial process or uh, let's say fugitive emissions um, due to the transport of fossil fuels, for instance. Uh, we will account for the most recent uh, climate action commitments, and we will consider several instruments to answer uh, your question uh, that are beyond carbon pricing. So the first one is uh, fossil fuel support removal, which is a kind of indirect uh, carbon pricing, but we will also consider behavioral subsidies to trigger the change uh, to low carbon uh, economy. We will so also consider regulations uh, as a policy instrument, which is not fiscal, and we will link all of these to the public budget. So um, what, I'm use what we are using is the OECD armed linkages model. So uh, it's a, a recursive dynamic CG model, multi-regional and multi-sectors um, with a, a modeling of energy, which is kind of like the previous papers. Uh, it's very close to the envisage model, for instance, uh, where we have uh, energy, uh, energy inputs that substitute mainly with capital. Um, and the model uh, has two particularities. The first one is the baseline calibration, which is uh, pretty detailed uh, and linked to the uh, International Energy Agency projections. And the second particularity is the, the presence of a lot of environmental indicators of which we will focus on greenhouse gas emissions. So how do we build a net zero emission scenario? Actually, it's not that easy with a CGE model where uh, everything is meant to work around the equilibrium and around, uh, let's say, with small deviations, whereas we are talking here about a very large decarbonization. And so we decomposed the policy in uh, three different pillars. Um, the one, one which is actual structural transformation. So that's really the change in the energy intensity of production or energy intensity of demand. Um, and we will calibrate that after the uh, World Energy Outlook projections uh, scenarios. I will come back to that a bit later. Uh, so that's the first pillar is actually change in energy intensity due to uh, investment in uh, new technologies or changes in behavior. The second pillar is uh, carbon pricing, direct or indirect, uh, and it will be uh, we will encompass, as I said earlier, earlier fossil fuel support removal, as well as carbon pricing. And finally, the third pillar, which is kind of a complement to the, the to the first one, uh, is the cost of the transition, because changing behaviors and changing energy intensity is not something that comes uh, out of the blue. Uh, somebody has to incur some costs, and we will model these costs, uh, whether it be an expenditure, an additional expenditure, or an additional investment, uh, through regulation or subsidies that will trigger the, the let's say the green behavior or green investments. Uh, and we will calibrate these costs also on the World Energy Outlook. So this leads us to uh, two scenarios, but I will focus on the one which is on the rightmost side, the NZD scenario, which stands for net zero emissions, uh, for which we will have the three pillars. So we will assume that the structural transformation uh, of the energy demand by firms and households will follow uh, the World Energy Outlook scenario uh, called NZD that they published last year. Uh, but this scenario is global, so we don't scale this to, to our uh, 26 region uh, level. 
I forgot to mention that we are using uh, GitHub 10 and that uh, we have aggregated the, the database to uh, 26 regions and uh, I think 37 sectors. Uh, second, we will consider pricing. So we will uh, we will uh, remove the the, the all the fossil fuel support that is uh, existing um, in this scenario uh, using estimates from the uh, OECD fossil fuel support inventory database and the IEA uh, fossil fuel support database, um, and we will assume that the current level will be fully removed. Uh, we will also assume in the NZD scenario a cap and trade system for the different regions in our model that will ensure that countries reach their NDCs in 2030 and reach a certain level of emissions, uh, which we call NZD, net zero emission in 2050, which corresponds to uh, the level of uh, sinks of carbon removals that can be uh, found in the particular region. And finally, we will also use uh, as I said, the cost of the transition uh, calibrated after uh, the World Energy Outlook projections. Um, so first, uh, a short look at the baseline. Uh, so in the baseline, we project uh, global CO2 emissions to grow from 40, something like 40 gigatons of CO2 equivalents in 2019 to uh, around 60 uh, gigatons in 2050. And that's clearly uh, not uh, sustainable at all. So on the right hand side, you see uh, the result of a soft coupling we have the ma with the magic model, which converts emission trajectories into uh, temperature increase. And it shows that our baseline in 2100 does something like four plus four degrees Celsius, which is uh, a lot. The last thing which is interesting in this slide is uh, the decomposition of global CO2 emissions. Uh, where here we depict in green the fossil fuel comb combustion emission and in uh, yellow, uh, brown, browny yellow, the, um, the industrial process emissions, which account for something quite significant, uh, uh, something around 10% uh, of global CO2 emissions, which highlights the importance of taking this into account. Um, so that's for the baseline. So now what are the scenarios that we are considering? Uh, so here you have the global CO2 emissions uh, in the different scenarios. You have the baseline at 60 uh, gigatons, that are, as I said. Uh, we introduced uh, an intermediate scenario that I will not discuss a lot, uh, which is the, the dark blue line. Uh, but what is interesting is uh, what is the trajectory we need to have for global gross emission to achieve net zero emission by 2050. And this uh, is an objective of something like 11 uh, gigatons of CO2 equivalent. We take this figure from uh, the image data set model uh, from PBL that they kindly shared with us. And this corresponds to the AFOLU um, uh, carbon sequestration they have in their, uh, let's say, net zero uh, scenario. So that's for, that's it for the global picture. Uh, now I will turn uh, to an example for the EU, uh, just to be a bit more uh, detailed. Um, so we will consider, we will take all the three pillars that I discussed before, the first one being structural transformation, so the change in energy intensity carbon pricing, uh, and uh, and also transition costs. Uh, so we'll first uh, start by looking at uh, CO2 emissions in the European Union in the different scenarios. Um, and you see from this graph that the reduction is pretty heavy for the EU because to achieve, uh, let's say, net zero emission at the, um, at the perimeter of the EU territory, uh, we, sh we need to go uh, from 3 gigatons of CO2 equivalents to something like 0 0.3. Uh, so this means uh, a, a more than 80% uh, reduction uh, by 2050. Um, and this is uh, quite a, a huge decrease. Uh, so now let's turn to the core of the results, which are on public finance. So here, what is depicted is the impact of the scenario uh, considered on a public budget. Um, we have the different colors representing different types of taxes. And uh, the presentation is such that if you are above zero, it means that you have more surplus 
uh, for the government budget. And if you are below zero, you have more deficit. You will notice that uh, in all scenarios, the surplus and deficits match uh, in terms of uh, magnitude. And that's because uh, of the closure rule for the government that we have in the model, uh, which assumes uh, for the moment that uh, all the extra revenues will be redistributed through lump sum transfer to households. Or alternatively, if there is a, a decrease in public revenue, it will be compensated by an uh, let's say a lump sum uh, negative transfer from households. What's in 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 interest interesting here, so on the left, on the right hand side, you have the impact for the public budget within the EU. Uh, please notice that I'm not talking about the budget of the European Union, but the overall public budget of all countries within the EU. Um, so here, uh, we see different impacts. Um, the main one is uh, by far the impact of explicit carbon pricing, which is the dark blue on the top, uh, which means that uh, imposing a carbon price will increase significantly uh, public revenues, which was expected. Um, uh, and the other measures that we implement uh, have also an impact, but are of a lower order of magnitude. Uh, namely, the fossil fuel support uh, on production and on consumption appear in the graph on in brown and gray. Um, so overall, we have here uh, an order of magnitude for the EU of something like uh, 1,500 billion USD uh, impact uh, on public finance, which is compensated by a lump sum transfer uh, in this modeling exercise. So that was for the net zero transition, let's say, at no cost. We only had here the first two pillars, the transition and the, and the, and the carbon pricing. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, but now let's turn to look at what is the impact of the different costs uh, that we integrate uh, within the model. Uh, so we I, here I depicted two of them. Uh, the first one is uh, the cost of the transition for households which means uh, basically buying uh, new cars, electric cars, and uh, refurbishing all the buildings, uh, the residential buildings. And this is achieved through a mix of regulation and uh, subsidy. Um, so that's the left part. And the right part is on the, the transport services cost. So this is for the air transportation, uh, water transportation, and ground transportation transition. Uh, and we assume that we have uh, a regulation that imposes the transition to electric vehicles and to more efficient uh, vehicles. So the first thing that is interesting to notice is that the magnitude of the bars overall is uh, way smaller than uh, the one we saw before, which is the, the which corresponded to the amount of, of revenue from carbon pricing. So at first glance, uh, we are here uh, an order of magnitude below. What is also interesting is that whereas uh, the previous policies were, uh, let's say, generating surplus for the government, um, these costs are actually also costs for the government, uh, even uh, if we are looking at regulations. Uh, so if you take transport services costs on the right hand part, uh, you don't have a direct impact on public finance because no tax rate is changed. But uh, you see that there is a decrease in the factor, uh, a, de a decrease in revenues from factor uh, taxes and a decrease in revenues from consumption taxes. That is the consequence of the change, uh, of the sectoral change uh, within the economy that is triggered by the regulation. Um, and once again, John, the, you yeah? have two minutes. OK, perfect. Um, and once again, uh, here, by, by assumption, we have a, a, a budget which is neutral. So all of this decrease in revenues are compensated by uh, a decrease in uh, lump sum transfer to households. <coughs> Sorry. So let me do, now turn to the concluding remarks. So the first, so um, these are very preliminary. So for the moment, we only look at the EU and uh, not everything is uh, finalized. But at first glance, it seemed that actually the low carbon transition can be a source uh, of extra revenues 
for the for the government, at least in the EU, because the the revenues from carbon pricing um, are way higher than the cost of triggering the transition by subsidies and regulations. Um, second, uh, what is interesting is that the impact of regulations uh, depend on general equilibrium effect. There is no di direct effect on public revenue, but uh, it, it's, it depends on the, on the general equilibrium effect and the magnitude can be very different. Uh, if you recall the, the previous slide, uh, actually the, the change, the, the cost for households were, was higher than the cost for transportation uh, services, whereas the public budget impacts were uh, the other way around. So it may vary between policies and between, um, between uh, regions. And finally, the, it's really important to, 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 to consider the government closure and recycling of the different taxes. As a final word, uh, just a word on the next steps. So for the moment, we have results for the EU and a few other regions. We are we're planning to go global. Uh, and also to do some sensitivity analysis on the two key things that we identified, the modeling of costs, so to compare properly carbon pricing versus subsidies versus regulation, and also to do a sensitivity analysis on revenue recycling. Um, I will stop there because uh, the other parts are for further research. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay, we thank you for your presentation um, and have now um, 10 minutes for discussion and there's already actually a first question in the chat and why I pose that the others might think about further questions. So there's a question from Julio Fournier. Thanks for the presentation. I am missing who is implementing these mitigation policies and OECD coalition. Um, yes, sorry, I, I was pretty uh, quick on the on the on the um, the scenario description. So what we are considering is a global transition to net zero. So it means every country in the world uh, goes to a global uh, level of emissions in 2050 that is uh, equal to the um, to the amount of carbon sequestration. Uh, so for the countries with an actual NZD commitment uh, like the EU. This is net zero emission at the level of the region, but for all the countries that don't have uh, an NZD commitment, uh, we consider an aggregate, uh, let's say, cap and trade system that ensures that they also achieve uh, net zero emissions. Uh, and the policies are designed after the um, International Energy Agency uh, World Energy Outlook 2021, which means that for all the 26 regions, we have a pathway uh, to net zero emission scenarios. Okay, um, I don't see a question yet, so I can um, ask one of my questions and uh, then afterwards, Larry, you go next. But I will start actually. Um, can you say a little bit more about how you model the structural changes? I assume that it's, I mean, net um, zero, especially in mobility and in um, heating, is a lot about electrification and really different technology. So you said something about e car, so you really model different production functions and not just um, fix some um, intensity parameters or something? So the modeling is twofold. Uh, the first part is actually fixing, as you said, uh, an efficiency parameter uh, to target a certain level of uh, energy demand by households and by firms. Uh, so this covers uh, mostly the, the buildings refurbishment, uh, transportation sector, uh, but also air and water transportation. But that's only the first part, uh, because uh, uh, taken uh, alone, it will make no sense because it will just come uh, out of nowhere. So that's why we introduced the costs. And that's where uh, we, we take the costs projected by the IEA and we uh, force by subsidy or regulation uh, a certain level of investment, uh, for instance, in the power sector, uh, we force additional investment to cover the transition or for household additional expenditures uh, such that they actually buy new cars or re really renovate the buildings. And this is either a subsidy uh, or a change in preference, which is our modeling of, uh, of regulation, uh, which means that in the end they bear the cost, uh, whether it be subsidized or uh, regulated. Okay, thank you. Then Larry, um, you have a question as well. 
thank you again for this uh, for another interesting and great uh, presentation. And uh, first of all, I'm, I'm glad to see that um, our, our our work I did um, our for the NF two years ago shares some similarity with your baseline, so which is uh, the global emissions reach reach about uh, sixty gigaton by twenty fifty, and also are uh, we we also are uh, assume a uh, similar level of our uh, our uh, carbon our uh, CCS by the end of uh, 50, I saw that you, you have a, about 10 gigaton by 2050. And then I have a question about the model because I know this um, MV linkage model to some extent. Uh, I understand that it, it is a recursive dynamic um, CG models, which means that agents make decisions um, period by period. They don't look forward uh, for many, uh, for, uh, over time. So um, 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 my question is that, um, Given this, uh, if we look at it, this given look, given this policy, uh, go into the a long time into the future. So, would that the um, forward looking behavior will play an um, important role? And also related to this, because um, when you talk about this public, um, our public finance, one important aspect of age of household is that whether they are recording a lot or, or not, right? So. But this model is a, is sort of a our agent making decisions period by period, so it, it can't capture this recording recording property at all. So, what is your view about this um, uh, this uh, uh, recursive uh, feature um, of the model, and the and the, um, and the implications for this um, uh, public finance over a long time? And another question is. Um, Sorry, I forgot my, uh, my yeah, I just uh, stop here, just, just this question. Thank you. Um, so uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, talk a bit about the CCS that you mentioned. Uh, so uh, just to make it plain that what we consider is only uh, carbon sequestration from uh, land use and land use change. Uh, we don't consider the, let's say, uh, technological solutions uh, for carbon capture, carbon sequestration. Uh, on the for forward-looking uh, uh, nature of the, the non-forward-looking nature of the model, so that's a very good question. Uh, uh, that's something that uh, might be uh, relevant. Uh, that, that, that is uh, relevant and may be interesting for the model. It's pretty hard to have it in such a large scale model. Um, so I, I think that's one of the main reasons. And also um, the, the fact that uh, this forward looking behavior is really uh, sensitive to a key parameter, which is uh, the, the preference for uh, the present. Uh, and uh, I know that the, the IAM models have been a lot criticized because uh, they chose some assumption on that and it's really hard to know what is actually the, the value for this parameter. But um, definitely uh, we should compare for it with these IAMs uh, to the extent that we can to have this, um, this uh, let's, to see what could be the impact of uh, forward-looking behavior. Um, the other point that was really interesting uh, in your question was the one on the forward-looking nature of public finance, uh, because of course what is missing in this model, as in almost every uh, CG model, is the debt part. Uh, so that's we have here a government closure, which is uh, that we need uh, to compensate losses by some surplus, and so on. And uh, really, that does not say anything about the sustainability of the debt, uh, because we don't have actually debt markets. Uh, but for this, we plan to work with the economic department of the OECD, who has uh, a model specifically designed for, uh, for sus debt sustainability. Uh, so what we will do is that we, uh, we, will, we will input our results in their macroeconomic model, and we will have some, uh, let's say, uh, at least some hints on what would be uh, the actual impact on sustainability. Thank you. I will first take a question now from the chat and then Laurent, I will um, um, turn to you. So um, Eddie uh, Beckers is wondering, um, how do you model the behavioral subsidies as plain production subsidies or did you extend the model? Might go a bit into the direction of my question, but maybe you can extend a bit on that. 
Um, yes, so uh, what we did is that we endogenized a, a certain level of subsidy uh, that uh, will help match an increase in investment or an increase in expenditure. And we do that through a mixed complementarity problem, uh, which means that if for some reason the model projects that there would be an increase in, uh, let's say, expenditure for cars, uh, then zero subsidy is necessary if it occurs naturally. Um, and so we designed a specific module of the model uh, that allows this swapping, uh, this viable swapping uh, for the different uh, alternatives, let's say, whether we have regulations uh, which change the, the preference parameters or subsidies which change the level of tax rates and swap them with a target level of uh, expenditure or investment. Okay, thank you. Then, Laurent, it's, uh, the floor is yours. Just uh, unmute yourself. Thank you, uh, Sonia. Thank you, uh, Jean, for the presentation. A quick question on, uh, also maybe a technical question, on the way you have modeled carbon taxes and cap and trade systems. Uh, do you have the two system really in the model? And the other um, point is, have you looked at the impact on carbon price? Um, yes, so we have both alternatives in the model, but in the NZD scenario, we are using uh, only a cap and trade system. Uh, so we fixed a maximum level of emissions uh, and, uh, and uh, the level of carbon tax will be endogenously determined to match this objective. Okay. Uh, we looked at, at the, the carbon prices, but I did not show them because that's the part where we still have to work a bit. Uh, because for the moment, we can only achieve these net zero emission scenarios with uh, taxes like uh, $10,000 a ton. Yeah, yeah, that's what uh, I thought too. <laughs> so uh, that's the part. Actually, the, 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 the next part on that will be uh, to, more, to refine more the induced innovation mechanisms, yeah, where yeah. Uh, actually carbon price can trigger some further uh decarbonation compared to just the substitution between uh yeah. between fuels and this should solve the problem and then i would be able to show the um, the, the okay. carbon taxes <laughs> thank you Jean. um i see no further questions in the moment so i have one more question actually and that is i think you didn't show any welfare effects i mean conventional wisdom should be that the carbon pricing scenario produces higher welfare but there might be some unexpected uh, general equilibrium effects or something so, so did you i guess you looked at welfare can you say something about that uh, yes, I looked quickly at it, but the results are too recent to dig into that. But uh, so what, what, what we noticed is that uh, there are a large general equilibrium effects and especially with uh, regulations because all go through, uh, uh, through changes in prices. And so it's really sensitive uh, to, the, um, to the sector and amount considered. Um, but uh, yes, that's something I, I have not at time yet to dig about, but that's really important because one of the purpose of going beyond carbon pricing is because of the distributional effect and the welfare effects on the general population. So this, this is definitely on the to-do list. It was a very good question. Okay, we have a bit more time. I think Laurent, your hand is still asked from last time. Um, I think so. Otherwise, is yeah okay. Is there any other any more questions? I mean, um, I don't see any, and I think nobody will be very sad if we end uh, some four or five minutes earlier and have another coffee or so. Yeah, the Laura, you're already um, doing a good thing. I um, actually, I think we should. Everybody should give our presenters. Um, uh, a big applause for their presentations and I thank everybody for participating in this session for your interesting questions. Um, I think we have um, learned a, a bit both on um, very actual policy like CBAM as well as more future looking policy towards net zero. And um, yeah, I wish you all a nice rest of the day. Enjoy maybe some more conference um, sessions and um, yeah, um, 
bye-bye and thank you to everybody again.